College. Um, I want to welcome you to this uh, really extraordinary facility and auditorium, uh, the Atkinson Auditorium at Cal IT2. And I want to thank um, Larry Smarr and Cal IT2 for making it possible for us to use the facility this afternoon. Um, there are a number of other uh, people and uh, units at UCSD that I would like to mention and thank. Um, the uh, Clarion What Writers Workshop, which meets here every summer and is in, will be in its fourth year at UCSD this summer. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson, who's here t today, uh, is on the uh, advisory board of Clarion. I um, want to thank the Center for Research and Computing in the Arts, CIRCA, uh, of which Sheldon Brown is the director, and Sheldon will be participating in today's uh, program. Uh, I want to thank the Council of Provosts, the Department of Literature, whose chair, Nina Ziri, is here. I saw her here. Oh, you moved. You fooled me. Uh, the Division of Arts and Humanities and its dean, Seth Lehrer. The Division of Physical Sciences and its dean, Mark Themans. And my own Revell College. These are the organizations that have uh, sponsored this event today. Uh, we're calling it Galileo Between Science, Science Studies, and Science Fiction. And the four participants uh, come from uh, these three fields and also the field of art, although the, 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 uh, the boundary between art and science, I think, is becoming a much more permeable one, uh, more and more. Uh, I won't give you detailed biographies of each of these people, but uh, let me mention first Mario Biagioli, who's here this week. Uh, he was the, uh, this year's binder. Uh, lecturer for the Literature Department on Tuesday, and he'll be participating in the program today. Professor Biagioli is in the History of Science Department at Harvard. Sheldon Brown, as I said, is the director of CERCA and is a member of our Visual Arts Department. Brian Keating, we have a real scientist on this panel. Uh, Brian Keating is an astrophysicist with the UCSD Physics Department and the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences. And Kim Stanley Robinson, a UCSD alumnus and major science fiction writer who has received all of the major awards in the field uh, and whose last, latest novel is a novel on Galileo called Galileo's Dream. I want to, before letting Sheldon take over, and he'll preside over the program itself, I just wanted to read you something from uh, an article that Mario Biagioli uh, published last summer in Critical Inquiry, which is one of the major theoretical journals in the humanities. Uh, this was published in summer of 09. The title of the article is Postdisciplinary Liaisons, Science Studies and the Humanities. And under a category that he calls modular cross-disciplinarity, uh, Professor Biagioli writes, rather than seeking some kind of disciplinary kinship between the humanities and the sciences, a naive project, I believe, we should keep an eye out for points of contact or shared problems. We could then work at these locations for as long as the contact lasts and then move on to other points of intersection. These intersections are not going to be between science and the humanities in general, but between specific lines of work in some scientific and some humanistic disciplines for some period of time. Such collaborations may not even appeal to scientists and humanities practitioners for the same reasons. They don't need to. It's not important to define how these emergent intersections should look and why collaborations should emerge around them, but rather to keep an eye out for them. And when they seem to happen, it is important not to frame them through the dichotomies, the two cultures image being a particularly influential one, that have framed previous conceptualizations of the relationship between science and the humanities. Now, as provost of Ravel College, uh, I, when, when I became provost, 
Uh, I was aware of the fact that I'm the first provost at Ravel who is from the humanities and not from the sciences. Ravel was founded at the time of the two cultures debate to which uh, Mario Piagioli refers. And I think the founders of Ravel College and of UCSD were very serious about contesting the notion of two cultures and thinking in terms of interdisciplinarity, interdiscipl interdisciplinarity across the divide between science, humanities, and the arts. And the kind of uh, program that we're about to present, I think, is, uh, is an instance of that tradition, but also more specifically of the notion of modular cross-disciplinarity that uh, Professor Biagioli uh, advocated in this, last, uh, in this uh, issue of uh, Critical Inquiry last summer. The, this event is actually the second event uh, that Clarion and uh, the Literature Department were involved with uh, Circa in. A couple of years ago, Kim Stanley Robinson, Jeff Ryman, another science fiction writer who was a writer in residence here at UCSD, uh, did a program with Sheldon on uh, using uh, Sheldon's uh, 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 Scalable Cities uh, uh, artwork. And uh, so this is actually part of what I hope will be a continued uh, series of collaborations between Circa those of us in literature and now in the sciences, uh, and Clarion. So please uh, let me uh, welcome all of you and, and uh, ask uh, Sheldon to present the program. Thanks, Don. Um, yeah, as Don says, this is uh, uh, kind of the second uh, uh, project we've done under the, under this rubric that, uh, that I call speculative culture, um, where we're really trying to look at how um, science fiction uh, as a, uh, a cultural undertaking gives us a certain way that we can think about cultural production in general and how it can give us new rich relationships between a kind of the analytical traditions of the humanities and uh, the uh, creative practices of the arts and the kind of inventive potentials of science and technology, and um, and so we uh, we're, we're uh, tr kind of take advantage of the opportunity of of Mario coming to campus um, and the uh, occasion of of Kim Stanley Robinson's uh, uh, Galileo's Dream recently being published. Um, to take another crack at this, and um, and and so in this in this instance, we've uh, you know tried to create a, a forum where we would start to have a, a, a conversation amongst different locations within that speculative culture matrix, and including and and in this case uh, instead of taking a existing artwork the uh, the scalable cities, uh, we've been working with uh, imagery of, of Jupiter and its moons and made a series of movies that will play in a kind of ambient way behind the talks that are going on tonight. Um, so we'll see, um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll lock that door so that, <laughs> so that doesn't happen again. <laughs> but that's right. Um, so, um, but and the occasion of this, uh, as I said, it, uh, is, takes advantage of the, the recent publication of, of the book Galileo's Dream, and it's it's quite an extraordinary novel. Um, it it's a novel that not only gives us a, a vivid account of of Galileo's uh, daily life uh, from about the time of the discover his discovery of Jupiter's moons. Um, through his, his, his trials for heresy and his imprisonment, home imprisonment by the Catholic Church. Um, but it shows in a, in a very deft way the social milieu that he navigated um, to undertake this activity called science and, you know, and start to kind of codify what that activity would be. And, and realized that at that time, you know, he had to be very entrepreneurial about how he would locate himself and take advantage of his, of his cultural situations and manufacture new cultural situations so he could undertake this activity. Um, 
But this isn't just a historical novel. It's also a science fiction novel. And, um, and through this, Galileo becomes a figure that not only changes the course of human history in our past, but also changes the, future, the course of human history in, our, in a possible future. Um, he, and and the, the interesting thing about this is, is, is this makes Galileo's historical role in some ways more pertinent and poignant to our particular moment right now, um, underscoring the ongoing ways in which individual insight uh, can have profound impact to changing uh, our worldviews. Um, and one thing that I'm struck by in the book is its, its, its seeming veracity. It, it, it shows that in the, the tremendous amount of research that Stan put into, the, uh, into writing this book, and, and in particular the research uh, and the work of Mario Biagiales, whose, um, whose work uh, you know, highlights those particular aspects, the, the ways in which Galileo you know, created uh, positions within his society that allowed him to do the work that he did. Um, now, Galileo's physics and astronomy uh, ultimately has had a profound impact on how we understood our position in the universe, and that's part of what got him into a bit of hot water at his, at, in his day. Um, but in this legacy of, of, of new scientific discovery, new ways of looking at the universe, new ways of understanding our role in the universe, um, continues to this day in, in contemporary physics and astronomy. And the work of Brian Keating uh, is involved in this and, sh and, it has, and is extending the, our ways of looking at the universe in new ways beyond just our unaided human eyes. And so we'll hear some of this very work that's going on right at this moment in this regards. Um, and so as I said, we'll also be playing behind all of this series of, of short movies that take both historical imagery and the most contemporary imagery that we're getting from uh, recent NASA missions about Jupiter and the Galilean moons. And for that, I also have to make sure I thank uh, Chris Head, who worked very closely with me in making these movies. And Chris put in the Galilean midnight hours um, of staring at Jupiter's moons for weeks and weeks on end. Um, and I also want to thank Mike Tolion and Todd Margolis and Hector Bracco for helping put together the 4K program. And so we're, we'll go through first with uh, uh, each of the participants uh, 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 kind of t telling us a bit about their work and then we'll get gather together and have a conversation amongst us. So with that, I'll give you Kim Stanley Robinson. And we could go with the house lights and then. Well, thanks, Sheldon, and uh, thank you, Dawn, and uh, everyone. I want to talk about the what it entails doing the uh, research for a Galileo novel, and also the impact of uh, Mauro Biagioli's uh, work on my uh, novel. Um, if you. The Galileo literature in English is uh, large but not uh, infinite. It, it, it essentially it consists of about uh, twenty books, some scholarly, some popular, and then a, 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 a very large number of articles that tend to be extremely specific in their content. So, uh, by and large, one can uh, confine research for a science fiction novel to just the the books involved, and that would include. Uh, very important from the novelist's point of view is some book that is not so much a, a coherent series as it is a genre, Daily Life In, so that you can get a book on daily life in uh, Inca, Peru, or daily life in uh, ancient Greece, or uh, daily life in Renaissance Italy, because early modern Italy doesn't seem to um, strike the same chord. But in any case, you need a daily life uh, book. And then um, there's a, a great book called Galileo at Work that describes the scientific work of, uh, by Galileo, by uh, Stillman Drake. Um, and then the biographies of Galileo are not, in English are not particularly good, but there, is a, there was a great Victorian book by uh, Mary Allen Olney called The Private Life of Galileo Galilei that uh, was really the work of his daughter, uh, Maria Celeste. 
uh, translated into English for the first time in the, in the Victorian era. And that book was somewhat reproduced as a bestseller a few years ago by a Dava Sobel called Galileo's Daughter. Very useful material. But you can read all this material and it's basically um, a mass of data, facts. And as a novelist, what would be interesting to do is to describe why these things happen. To, something with some kind of explanatory power. And also, when you're doing historical novels, what's interesting is to describe a culture that was different from now and describe how it was different in ways that are interesting to uh, uh, illumination on our own time. So you want uh, to see what was similar in human life in the past. So this is almost exactly 400 years ago since this book was uh, published, not this one, some others. Uh, the Sidereus uh, had its uh, 400th um, anniversary uh, two two months ago, and and but the the sense of difference in an earlier culture uh, was something that I began to come to understand better from the reading of Mario's work, and which it comes from the field of science studies. And so you have to understand the history of science in in, in literature for the rest of us as being in a kind of pre-paradigm state that it was purely descriptive, and it seemed like ideas had the life of their own, and there was a kind of a idealistic notion that the rest of society didn't matter, and that scientists just had great thoughts, and then the next scientists had great thoughts that revised their great thoughts. And there was a disconnect between society and science that was marked in the, in the description of what was going on. Well, that changed when Thomas Kuhn wrote his um, Structure of Scientific Revolutions in about 1960. And, uh, and then after that, there was what people called the cultural turn in the 70s and 80s, when the uh, uh, literary techniques out of study of literature and the study of philosophy began to get imported into the history of science. And some of that began right here at UCSD or across the street at Salk Institute when Bruno Latour spent a year studying the scientists at Salk Institute as if they were tribesmen of a strange tribe. The, the, the men and women of some anthropological group that was utterly different from us, and it didn't matter what the content of their work was, they were being studied for their methodology as a different culture. So this was the kind of method of, of Claude Lévi-Strauss being imported into modern scientists as a tribe of their own rather than um, some exotic or primitive tribe. And that led to science studies, and, and uh, Mario Biagioli was editor of the Science Studies Reader and has been sort of central to the effort in the, in the sort of post-Bruno Latour period, and happily also one of the world's chief experts on Galileo. So his book, Galileo Courtier, was a major, um, uh, of major importance to me when I was researching this book because suddenly I began to understand things that I had only seen before. And one of the things that Galileo Courtier made clear to everybody is that this was a world without scientists, that Galileo had to invent invention, as Mario put it a couple days ago in his lecture, and, and he even had to invent the concept of what a scientist was and, and did, so that when he got his patronage from uh, Cosimo in Florence, the, the Grand Duke of Florence, he was very specific about what his role would be, so that there would be the court jester, there would be the musicians, and then there would be the chief philosopher and mathematician. And it was important that philosopher and mathematician were combined together in what, when you don't have the word scientist, this is what his, he was attempting to describe. This was the role he was inventing. So I want to read one, uh, a paragraph from Mar uh, Mario's book here. Deaths of great patrons, especially of monarchs like popes who were not members of a hereditary dynasty, were perceived by contemporaries as major patronage crises. Careers were suddenly made and destroyed on those occasions. The end of Galileo's Roman successes, marked by the trial of 1633, can also be seen as framed by patronage dynamics. It was well known that patronage quakes could clear the grounds for the construction of brilliant careers at the Roman court, but could also shatter them. There are indications that Cosimo II's death in 1621 put Galileo in an unstable patron situation, one which gave Galileo cause to worry about the security of position at court. The pattern was so familiar that the courtier's philosophy, a court game not unlike today's monopoly, published in Madrid in 1587, prescribed that those who landed on square 43, your patron dies, had to go back to the beginning. So this is the kind of detail in the culture of the time that began to give me a handle on what I wanted to do and the story that I wanted to tell. 
Um, similarly, in the, in the fairly large bulk of Galileo's own writing, um, it was uh, Biagioli's book that pointed out to me for the first time the importance of a passage from the uh, Sayer called, um, and this is a book from like 1623, when and Galileo was really at his high point and had, be, had was achieving the patronage of the brand new pope who had been a cardinal who had quite liked him before, Maffeo Barberini, who became Urban the, the Eighth. And it, uh, let me read again from Mario's book, Urban and the Fable of Sound. In the fall of 1623, Cesarini wrote to Galileo that the pope loved the assayer so much that he was having it read to him during meals. A few days later, Galileo was told that Ciampoli kept reading parts of the book to the pope who seemed particularly fond of the so-called fable of sound. Those were the pages in which Galileo told the story of a man who hears a certain sound, and this was a kind of like a bird cry, he thinks, at first. Um, and he tries to discover its origin. Each time he thinks he has found its real cause, which is like a creaking gate or somebody playing a fiddle or water being rubbed around the edge of a glass, he hears the same sound again and realizes there is yet another way by which nature produced it. By following this same sound through a number of different causes, this man eventually finds a cicada. He thinks that finally he has a chance to find out the real cause of the sound, and he decides to perform a, quote, crucial experiment. And here's from Galileo. At length, lifting up the armor of its chest and seeing beneath this some thin, hard ligaments, he believed that the sound was coming from a shaking of these, and he resolved to break them in order to silence it. But everything failed until, driving the needle too deep, he transfixed the creature and took away its life with its voice, so that even then he could not make sure whether the song had originated in those ligaments. Uh, this, now, Biagioli says, Urban liked this parable not only because it was the literary high point of the assayer, but because it was the epitome of court culture itself. It showed that the pleasure was in the appreciation of the virtuosity of nature, that is, in the multiplicity of the causes by which nature, and therefore God, could produce a given sound. By trying to find the real, unique cause of the sound, one not only fails, he also kills the cicada and the pleasure of the inquiry with it. By seeking necessary causes rather than enjoying the novelties encountered along the way, one is a deluded philosopher, and one does not know how to play the courtier. By killing the cicada, one displays lack of philosophical virtuosity, courtliness, and respect for God's infinite power. So this is really getting to the heart of the matter when it comes to um, the, the problem that Galileo began to have with Urban. And Urban uh, actually discussed this in conversation with Galileo when Galileo came to Rome to try to get permission for his book. And this was eventually called, uh, because of the way it was described in Galileo's uh, Dialogo, with the Angelica Datrina. The idea that God could have done it in any way and that uh, he could have done it in all kinds of different ways. And so a single explanation is a kind of an affront to God, an attempt to put limits on God, who is essentially omnipotent. So that it was a, a mistake, it was a theological error to try to give single causes to physical events. And I found this so interesting, not only because it began to explain what happened to Galileo in the trial, but also because it gave me some reverse engineering into my own plot. In my story, Galileo is taken off by time travelers from the future to the 31st century. And my, one of the jokes that I got to play there was that um, essentially when we contemplate the 31st century, we're much closer to Galileo than we are to them. It's easier to understand and be a, a compatriot a intellectual to Galileo than it is to people from the 31st century. And then in my future plot, life being found inside the planet Europa in the ocean that is underneath that icy surface, and then later even in the big planet itself, um, I could recapitulate the fable of sound. And every time Galileo comes back to his own time, he's been given an amnesia drug so that he doesn't really remember what happened to him in the 31st century. And so when he writes down the fable of sound, he's not only uh, explicating the kind of the angelica doctrina for Urban, but he's also dimly remembering what happened to him out on the moons of Jupiter. So for me, this was tremendous fun. Um, then we come to Galileo's famous trial, and I have to say this is a beautiful opportunity for a novelist, that um, there was a nun who could do stenography taking 
uh, a complete transcript of that trial. So there might as well have been a tape recorder running during the depositions and the major parts of Galileo's trial. And they were kept by the Vatican, and they are now there for all of us to read. So that was an absolutely beautiful opportunity as far as I was concerned. Um, but the trial is strange. It, it's filled with reversals, with uh, what appears to be broken promises. It looks like maybe the Vatican forged some documents in order to stick Galileo even more than he was stuck. Uh, and so uh, in understanding the trial itself, I got a lot of help from Mario's book. And here's a, a, a very interesting little footnote where he's r telling us someone else's observation. Morpurgo Tagliabui argues that Macalano, and this is the chief prosecutor, seized on a statement uttered by Galileo during the interrogation of 12 April 1633. This was the meeting in which the Inquisition confronted Galileo with defying the injunction allegedly given him in 1616 not to hold, defend, or teach the Copernican doctrine in any fashion. According to Morpurgo Tagliabui, Galileo was so surprised and confused by this new accusation that he overdid his defense by arguing in the, that in the dialogue he never tried to defend Copernicus, but that he was actually trying to refute it. Now this was definitely a bit too much, for it was in patent contradiction with the content of Galileo's book. Macalano may have used this faux pas to convince Galileo that this utterance could be easily construed as indicating his bad faith and would also be perjury under oath. Uh, and cunning behavior in the entire matter. Therefore, the best thing for him to do was to confess now rather than have the Inquisition go ahead and expose his deceit. So then uh, Macalano writes to his superiors and says, please, can I have a private, a private um, interview with Galileo? I think I can convince him to con convince to whatever we want. And this, this private interview happened, and afterwards Galileo confessed. But of course, the private interview was off the books. And it gave me a fantastic opportunity to write that dialogue. That conversation between Macalano and Galileo had to be incredibly fraught with the overtones of being burned at the stake if you make a mistake in this particular conversation. Because this was not a trial in the modern sense. It was not that he could be judged guilty or innocent. It was he was already condemned by the trial being called at all. And it was a question of what would his uh, sentence and punishment B. So um, the, there's a scholar, Giorgio de Santiana, a historian of science, uh, who wrote The Crime of Galileo, who had some speculation about this particular conversation as well that helped me. And it was, it was just a, a beautiful opportunity for a novelist that comes rarely. Well, ultimately, Mario's book has a, sec, uh, a, a, a thesis that, that indicates that the only way that science could get away from the Angelica Doctrina were essentially you were part of the entertainment for the court. In the evening, you'd have some music, you'd have an intellectual debate, and this would just be something that there was no intent to come to an understanding of the real causes of things. It was more entertainment. And so uh, in, in near the end of his book, Mario says, experiments, like other forms of non-contentious claims, offered a way out of this deadlock of the patronage system. Experimentally produced matters of fact were more circumscribed claims about nature. Such matters were not only theologically safer, but by putting one's honor less on the line, their legitimation involved fewer risks. And then, because their acceptance was inherently linked to collective witnessing, matters of fact were the perfect type of claim to be legitimized by a corporation of scientific practitioners rather than by an individual patron. They represented a scientific practice which fit perfectly the new institutional situation of science, which in turn reflected the practitioner's emancipation from the deadlock of the patronage system. With the introduction of experimental practices, we move from spectacular but not necessarily terminable disputes to less, or maybe just differently, spectacular but manageable and terminable debates. Experiments were not just the most effective way to produce new knowledge, to entertain and attract academicians, to keep clear from accusations of religious or political unorthodoxy, and to produce a platform of collectively acceptable data upon which the academicians cooperative work and a dialogue could be based. Experiments were also a way out of the deadlock of non-committal arbitration typical of patronage. 
by providing a construction, constructive management of distances and social status well beyond the range of possibilities provided by the patronage system, experimental practices may have been not only an effect, but also a cause for the development of scientific institutions. So this is an ongoing battle. This is, to me, the description of the difference between science and power, a kind of, uh, because patronage never went away. We still have patrons. We still have uh, essentially the feudal pyramid of power in, 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 embodied in the money and power on this planet right now. And so science is continuing to deal with that and is a counterforce to it that has more and more weight in government. Government is no longer nepotism and corruption, but is more bureaucracy and technocracy. So that the more science manages to invade human affairs, the more you can say that it is a matter of fact rather than a matter of patronage. And so this becomes, to me, Galileo's big story, the thing that he started that is still ongoing. Now, that's Ganymede, and that's Galileo Reggio, the dark spot over there, the Galileo region. His name is all over the Galileans as you might expect. And let's see if we can, there's that moment when science fiction goes beyond the sources, and I want to take that moment right now and just read a couple passages from the book that get us out there into this zone. Um, how about the first time that the stranger comes to ask Galileo to look through his own telescope, which is quite a bit squatter. Oh, thank you. It's all right. It's up there. Um, the stranger says to Galileo one night on Galileo's Altana, take a look through this one. Well, take a look and see. Well, there was no reply to that. It was what he had been saying himself to Cremonini and everyone else. Just look. So Galileo moved his stool over to the new device, sat down, leaned forward. He looked into the eyepiece. The thing's field of vision was packed with stars and seemed large, perhaps 20 or 30 times what Galileo saw through his glass. At its center, what he took to be one of the moons of Jupiter gleamed like a round white ball marked by faint lines. It was bigger than Jupiter itself was in Galileo's glass. The harder Galileo looked, the more obviously spheroid the white moon became, its striations more visible. It stood out like a snowball against the stars, which burned in their various intensities against a depth of velvet black. It appeared that the white ball, clearer than ever to his sight, had faintly darker areas, somewhat like Earth's moon, but more prominent by far was its broken network of intersecting lines, like the crackleure on an old painting. In some places, the lines appeared in parallel clusters, in others, they rayed out like fireworks, and these two patterns overlapped and shattered each other repeatedly. One crackle pattern clarified for him, gleaming in exquisite detail. Focusing on it appeared to increase the enlargement accordingly until it filled the lens of the eyepiece. A wave of dizziness passed through his whole body. It felt like he was falling up towards the white moon. He lost his balance. He felt himself pitch forward, head first, into the device. Things fall in parabolic arcs, but he wasn't falling. He flew up and forward, outward, head tilted back to see where he was going. The plain of shattered white ice bloomed right before his eyes, or below him. Maybe he was falling. His stomach flopped as his sense of up and down reversed himself. He didn't know where he was. He gasped for air. He was drifting downward. Now he was upright again. His sense of balance returned just as distinctly as sight returned when you closed and then opened your eyes, something definitive. It was an immense relief and the most precious thing in the world, just that simple sense of up and down. He stood on ice that was an opaque white, much tinged by oranges and yellows, sunset colors, autumn colors. He looked up. A giant banded orange moon loomed in a black starry sky. It was many times bigger than the moon in Earth's sky, and its horizontal bands were various pale oranges and yellows, umbers and creams. The borders of the bands curled over and into each other. On the moon's lower quarter, a brick-red oval swirl marred the border of a terracotta band and a cream band. The opaque plane of ice he stood on was picking up these colors. He put his fist up with his thumb stuck out. At home, his thumb would have covered the moon. 
This one was seven or eight times that wide. Suddenly he understood. It was Jupiter itself up there. He was standing on the surface of the moon he had been looking at. And there it is. That's Europa, where he has landed. And he goes inside it with the local citizens. I won't attempt to describe the intricacies of the plot, because that would be impossible. It's a time travel story, and so never try to describe the plot of one of those. But um, they take a, a submarine, you might say, down under the ice. So there's about 10 kilometers of ice, and then there's a couple hundred kilometers of water before you hit the solid rocky mass of Europa. Amazing but true, and it's one of the places where life might be on this planet. And in my book, uh, in, uh, in this solar system, I mean, and in my book, they do find it there. But here's a little conversation with his main um, informant, his antagonist, his psychotherapist, you might say, a woman named Hera. Uh, and this is on their way down. They waited, absorbed in their thoughts. The light downward pull of Europa made the crew's movements around the bridge fluid and slow, like dancing in a dream. Galileo found it hard to keep his balance. It was somewhat like floating in a river. He drifted to Hera's side and said, all these machines have to work for us to stay alive. Yes, that's right. Well, it seems risky. It is, but because it is, we engineer for safety. Materials and power are terrifically advanced compared to your time. And there's a principle called redundancy at the criticalities. Do you know this term? Replacement systems are available in case of failures. Bad things still sometimes happen, but there you are. They do anywhere. But on Earth, Galileo objected, in the open air, the things you make don't have to work for you to survive. Don't they? Your clothing, your language, your weapons, they all have to work for you to stay alive, right? We are poor forked worms in this world. Only our technologies and our teamwork allow us to survive. Galileo pursed his lips. There might be some truth to what she had said, but he still felt it obscured a real difference. Worm or not, he said, um, you could stay alive on Earth by breathing, eating, and staying warm. Granted, these take effort, but you can make the effort. You have tools to help you, but they don't have to remain unbroken for you to survive. A single man alone on an island could do it. There are no mechanical contrivances that surround you and protect you like a fortress that have to function successfully forever, or else you very quickly die. She shook her head. It's like a sea voyage. You could not have your ship sink and survive. But you people never land, Galileo said. You sail on forever. Yes, that's true, but it's true for everyone, always. Galileo recalled standing in his garden at night, in the open air, under the stars. It was an experience this woman had never had. Possibly she could not imagine it. Possibly she had no idea what he was talking about. You don't know what it is to be free, he said, surprised. You don't know what it is to stand free in the open air. She shook her head impatiently. Have it your way. I will. Again, her amused glance, as if she were looking down on a child. And she said, you were famous for that, as I recall, until things went wrong. And now lastly, I want to finish by reading one more passage. Uh, the voyage continues uh, later on in the book quite a bit. Uh, and I want to um, shift into the, um, the Jupiter photos, if we can, um, to take the trip further into Jupiter. And at this point, he, uh, Galileo has two guides or more. One, uh, the woman Hera, who sticks with him throughout, and one, a woman mathematician named Aurora. Well, and they're headed towards Jupiter. We look like a sperm headed for the egg, Aurora said at one point. I wonder if we will be fertile, and what might be born of it? Are you in communication with Jupiter itself, Galileo asked her. Yes, or what lives in it, but only in the same way we were in communication with the European sentience. The exchange is mathematical and seems to indicate our interlocutor exists in other manifolds, so that this is a somewhat weak interaction for it. For those reasons or others, we are having trouble establishing any system to convey meaning. Well, how did you know it wanted to come, us to come up to it? It was a kind of geometrical schematic, and then there were changes in Ganymede ships that allowed us to capture them. We are being drawn there by logical inference, you might say. A tractor beam of logical inferences. 
Galileo said to her, can you give me some more of the learning drug that you gave me during your tutorials? She nodded, never taking her eyes from Jupiter. I was thinking the same thing myself. Do you think it's wise? Why not, Galileo said. Anything to get the taste of your ashes out of my mouth. He didn't say he's just been given a history of the human race, and it's been depressing, to say the least. He wondered what effect the uh, intelligence drug would have on her, augmented in her mentation as she already was by her machine earrings. He realized he had no idea what might be going on in her head, what kind of creature she was, and she was their leader now. Time passed, a protraction of mind. Galileo's thoughts began to race and bloom, to sing in their polyphonic fugue. He watched the godlike planet with its storm-wracked surface slowly fill their entire sky. Space was now a black velvet ring bordering an immense mottled plain. When Galileo looked behind his chair, he saw that the black was a dome, starry as before, but everything was now obscured by a flickering indigo mist, as if they flew within a giant spark. They homed in on one of the biggest of the many red spots. The original red spot, apparently. From where they were now, the texture of the great red spot was much more articulated, revealing that it was not flat, but rather an immense broad dome, raised up from the surface of the planet, marked by finer and finer turbulences. Smaller spins were still visible outside the great red one, some spinning clockwise like it and raised up like boils, others spinning counterclockwise and forming depressions like whirlpools. All these phenomena seemed to Galileo to be elaborations of the simplest forms. They were circles spun hard until, under the impetus of irregularities in each other, they became elliptical shapes, spitting out colorful streamers at their edges. These shot away in parabolic paths, slowed in the resistance of gas clouds of umber and sulfur, and then spiraled up into new red circles of their own, the characteristic eddying repeated across all the scales visible. Brick on orange, on umber, on tan, on sienna, on yellow, on bronze, on copper, on white, on mud, on hazel, on gold, on cinnabar, on cinnamon. Then they were closing on Jupiter itself, its cloudy surface, which now looked like the side of an entirely different kind of universe, space itself dense with color. The great red spot was revealed more clearly than ever as a kind of thunderhead top rising up out of the surface of the great planet, as big perhaps as the whole Earth, and now palpably down below them, so that they stood or sat in the cabin looking down past their feet at it. Their ship descended until the turbulent brick-colored clouds were just under them. No part of Jupiter beyond the red storm was visible at that point. The clouds below were not a uniform red, but shifting woven banners of salmon, brick, sand, copper, citron. There was no sign of anything aware of their presence. The little voice of Ganymede nattered on from his helmet, complaining still that he had been kidnapped, that approaching Jupiter was a fatal error, a stupid gesture likely to fry them all in radiation if it did not bring down death by ontological exposure, and so on. More than once, Hera revealed, reached to him and turned down the volume coming from his helmet, but she never silenced him entirely. The ship came to the surface of the great red spot, floating just over a red sheet of clouds which spun in majestic rotation. What now? demanded the little voice of Ganymede. Hera was studying her screens. Down, she said. Their craft touched the cloud. They felt a little rocking side to side, front to back, like being in a boat in a tidal race. Down again, it got darker. The light became like that of certain smoky sunsets, dull yellows shading to the orange nearest brown, streaked with swirls of bronze or an occasional patch of bright spun gold. There were no patterns Galileo could discern, although he stared into the murk, wondering if something might emerge. Everywhere there were ripples, including a cobalt pattern like the ripples of a damasked blade. This S-folding was also a spirality ruled by the Fibonacci sequence, but made dynamic and strange by compression and torque, a chaotic mass of tightly curving lines. And then he saw more shapes in the warps of color, spicules that were like thorn balls, usually triradiate in form, various kalima, looking like masses of vesicles whipped into a stiff froth, also bubbles, free or suspended, within cubes or tetrahedrons, Banners like festoons, like barges, spiraling in all kinds of ways, 
In the spiral of Archimedes, in which each unit or gnomon added was the same, making coiled cylinders like springs that rolled in the flow, also equal angular spirals, each gnomon bigger in a geometric progression, thus conical and nautiloid. Seeing them, Galileo tried to say to Aurora, had the force of gravity varied as the cube rather than the square of the distance, the planets would have shot away as their orbits would have become equiangular spirals. And then, see that pattern. It breaks the sequence there. It would need to be described by a new equation. Aurora replied in his head, this is an organism. This is a mind thinking. Its body is a swirling mass of gas clouds, elements intermixing. It's not like us, at least not superficially. It's some kind of whole, but so are we. And so what now, Ganymede insisted. Aurora said, down again. Down until we meet it, or it meets us. I'll stop there. Thank you. And now? Oh, good. Now, Mario Biagioli. Um, so it's, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with uh, Stan and continue uh, to kind of piggyback um, on interesting events that are organized about uh, his work. Uh, I'm a, a happy parasite on this end. Um, I'm also very happy to have the opportunity to meet uh, Brian and learn uh, a little bit more about his impressive work uh, in, uh, in instruments in uh, Antarctica that uh, he will show us in, uh, in a few minutes. And also to have uh, you know, the, the possibility of wit to witness the, the, the wonderful work that uh, Sheldon Brown and his team are able to do, and also to do so quickly here at, uh, at Circa. So unlike, uh, I assume that unlike most of the audience here, I do not read uh, much science fiction uh, though the last few years I uh, have read quite a few books by Stan that he has graciously sent me just to educate me a bit. Um, so reading Stan's manuscript and then uh, the, the printed uh, um, version of uh, uh, the book has uh, triggered all sorts of interesting, at least you know, things that I find interesting myself, about the relationship between science fiction and uh, um, uh, history of science. Um, so uh, reading the, the uh, Stan's work has been, you know, pleasurable in and of itself, but it has uh, also, uh, in particularly, has made me uh, think about uh, what uh, historians of science and historians uh, in general do, and this really has to do with just the. the the mundane experience of uh, reading a text where uh, you can see that uh, some aspects of my work have been uh, uh, provided some material, some, uh, some thought, uh, you know, by Stan, and they're, but they're presented in a completely, actually sometimes completely different uh, way. Sometimes, you know, uh, they are, you know, uh, uh, twisted in interesting ways. So is, is this kind of... Uh, 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 the experience of seeing something that you know, you think you know fairly well, and then uh, it's, it appears uh, in a different uh, uh, shape. So um, there are uh, a lot of uh, interesting surprises. And by the way, uh, I, I want to stress that interesting, it's, it's a completely subjective term here because I, um, you know, I, I'm not, uh, uh, you know, I, I really haven't thought very much about problems of writing history or uh, um, uh, science fiction and the literature about science fiction, so I might be inventing one wheel after another here. Um, so I, uh, so for instance, some of the things that, uh, uh, that uh, caught my attention as I was reading would be, say, to find an event uh, from the life of Galileo that I knew quite well and then see that this event actually segues into something that is completely uh, different. Or having 
uh, you know, to see the, the, the timeline uh, modified. So, you, you know, to have, you know, to see events that uh, I, you know, I take to be historical events that are out of sequence or, or uh, you know, uh, just opposed in, uh, in ways that are uh, uncommon. Uh, or also the, the reverse effect of, uh, if you want, seeing something that has been, quote, fictionalized, is to read a, like a quote from a document, and, and Stan quotes lots of documents in his book. And then you see a little detail, and I assume, a detail that I had not noticed before, and I had assumed that Stan had included that detail as a fictional reality effect. And then instead it turns out that it was actually in the document, and I had never uh, noticed it. But, uh, but the thing that, uh, you know, the, the, the aspects of the book that, uh, you know, uh, I found more, uh, you know, more kind of thought-provoking than, than that was to realize that uh, the detailed descriptions, actually, see, that's already uh, a slip, uh, the, the narrative uh, that Stan uses to uh, represent the daily life of Galileo, they sounded, they read uh, surprisingly realistic. So, for instance, uh, the activities in his uh, instrument making uh, workshop, the, you know, the, the, the interaction with uh, his uh, students and the members of his uh, household, uh, the description of uh, his surroundings, uh, the floor, the walls, uh, the, the, the furniture, the, you know, the kitchen uh, utensils, the food, uh, the parting uh, sex life, and then his, uh, uh, his old age, and, and actually, I thought that uh, the, the description of Galileo's old age that takes up a substantial part of the book is, uh, is quite interesting because in standard uh, history of science or biographies of Galileo, what you see is that the emphasis is on uh, the period in which uh, you know, the action happened, the so-called action happened. Right? And then the late years are compressed. You know, Galileo wrote the last, you know, there was a trial. And then uh, he spent uh, some uh, years at, uh, in house arrest, and then he died. And instead, in the book, uh, it's like when you go to, you see a film where there are these very long takes that, you know, that you, you are there, you, you look at the film and say, okay, now when is the next edit? And the edit doesn't come, right? And so there is the, the, the sense of really uh, the, the, the stretching of, uh, of the event that actually creates a completely... Uh, a different effect from uh, the kind of the very kind of synoptical, glossed over um, uh, description that you find in uh, in, uh, in books. Now, uh, so I start thinking about so what's interesting about this, meaning that uh, there are all these uh, detailed descriptions that I don't that commonly you would not take to be factual but actually they create an effect of uh, a pretty uh, interesting, informative, detailed historical uh, narrative. So I start thinking about, and again, and here, uh, this, I may be you know, um, you know, displaying my uh, ignorance rather than uh, uh, anything else. So uh, I was thinking about the, you know, notions of, uh, I mean, by now outdated notions of, say, thick description, you know, girts, right? And then you start realizing that, you know, thick description effectively, it's, it's, it's nothing but thick, right? So as historians or even as, you know, ethnographers, what you do is that you have a few little bits of evidence scattered uh, over weeks, I mean, depending on what time scale you operate, there can be a few events a day, there can be a few events a month, there can be a few events a year, or, uh, you know, or perhaps a few you know, events you know, every 10 years. So you really have a few events, or call them you know, data points, whatever you want to call them. And then you have to put them together through a narrative. And so if you think about it, you know, most, act most of historiography is actually filler. It it's really about the narratives that you develop to connect uh, these uh, these few points uh, that uh, uh, that uh, that you have. So, in a sense, you know, uh, doing uh, history, especially you know, if you do early modern history where evidence is not, uh, uh, th there isn't really a lot. 
it's a, it's a bit like doing, you know, paleontology. You have a bone of a dinosaur here, another bone there, and suddenly you walk into a museum and there is a dinosaur uh, skeleton standing in front of you with uh, uh, the background of, you know, the little pond, the lakes, you know, the, the, the trees, other animals. So effectively you have uh, reconstructions that are really based on uh, a, few, uh, a few bones and then a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, speculative anatomy, or sometimes, you know, not only, you know, speculative anatomy, you can have, uh, you know, until recently, and I assume, you know, probably Stephen also in the present, uh, a lot of uh, dinosaurs that you see in museums are composites, you know, are composites from uh, uh, various dinosaurs. So you cobble up, you cobble together uh, different uh, bones from different, uh, uh, you know, dead uh, animals. In some cases, you put, uh, you know, uh, plaster casts as, uh, you know, as, uh, uh, as placeholder. So, but the difference is that in paleontology, there is an acknowledgement that this is the case. You know, it's not that uh, in the literature, you know, about, say, museum displays, this, you know, you know th that there is no evidence that uh, these reconstructions are in fact, uh, highly uh, artifactual. Instead, in history, there is no acknowledgement of uh, uh, the fact that uh, most of the narrative is really um, a narrative, a filler between uh, events. Now, so um, it seems to me that once you acknowledge that this is the predicament of writing history, then uh, I think the next step is basically just to discuss uh, what kind of narratives uh, you know you can develop to uh, connect these dots? Right. So the issue is no longer you know truth versus fiction. So history you know being about truth and uh, science fiction being about fiction is just a different you know a, a distinction between what kinds of narrative you can deploy to do the same uh, the same thing. That is connect uh, um, you know dots. So the other thing that I think it's, it's, it's relevant is that, so not only uh, you have, uh, 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 there is no other way, that, you know, I mean, part of the predicament of writing history is, uh, you know, develop uh, uh, narratives, a lot of narratives. But also is that in order to develop this, you have to think about how things could have happened otherwise, okay? So uh, if, if you are trying to make sense of, uh, why a certain event happened, or why you know a certain you know um, uh, idea, cultural movement, whatever. You have to think about what could have, what else could have happened, and why uh, it didn't. Okay. So effectively, I think that the everyday practice of history is based on a series of counterfactual histories that you don't write down. So you run all this counterfactual history in your mind, and then you pick the narrative that uh, makes most sense to you, and you erase the fact that you have thought all about all these other counterfactual histories. So uh, at the point, I realized that uh, instead, um, again, uh, another major difference uh, in, in genre, not in terms of truth uh, versus fiction, you know, between, you know, comparing history of science to stance work, is that in stance work, the alternatives are written up, okay? So um, let me read you a piece from, um, from the end of the book. This is where uh, Cartophilus, Cartophilus is a character um, who is, um, also, you know, one of uh, an inhabitant of the, he comes from the moons of Jupiter, and he has been planted in Galileo's household as a, a hybrid figure between protector, a spy, uh, some sort of, uh, um, you know, somebody who controls Galileo. So, uh, uh, Cartophilus in Stan's book does not, I mean, he has a very long lifespan. So he doesn't die, he's ancient, uh, when uh, he meets Galileo, and he keeps going. So it looks like he might die, perhaps, in the French Revolution. So he's, uh, he's waiting to be guillotined, you know, a few days after Lavoisier. 
and thinks that perhaps this is it. He, he might die the next day. So say, this may be it. One last night, I find it hard to believe, which no, no doubt explains my stoic lack of fear. If it happens, it happens. I'm tired of the tumbrol days. And if this turns out to be the end, in these last hours, I'll be thinking hard. Imagination creates events, and by dawn, I intend to have lived 10,000 years. Then my part of the tapestry will loop back in, the threads spreading out through the rest of the pattern. And I'll be done with this story, which I've tried so hard to stay out of. Some of it I saw, some of it Hera told me, some of it I made up. That's fine, that's the way it always is. Some of it you made up too. Reality is always partly a creation of the observing consciousness. So I've said what I like, and I knew him well enough, he being Galileo, uh, to think I got it mostly right. I know he was like us, always looking out for himself, and unlike us, that in that he acted while we often lack the courage to act. I wrote this for Hera, but no matter what time you are, you are in when you read it, I'm sure that the history tell yourself, sorry, the, I'm sure that the, that the history you tell yourself is still a tale of mangled potentiality, of unnecessary misery, that's just the way it is. So this, uh, th this, uh, this uh, line about uh, history being a tale of uh, mangled potentiality is one of the crucial themes of uh, uh, Stan's uh, book, where you have effectively uh, various, if you want, you know, kind of parallel, uh, parallel realities. And uh, within these parallel realities, you have people who move uh, up and down in time and also in, 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 uh, in space as a result of that. So in the book, Galileo both uh, dies at the stake and survives. Okay. And every time there is, uh, uh, a, 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 you know, tra you know, motion in time, the entire, if you want, the entire, the entire ecology of these potentialities gets uh, modified. So, uh, what interested me about this is that, again, what what Stan does is that he foregrounds all this potentiality. And so, and you know, one, one would say, well, okay, so he's making them up. Uh, well, I think that technically, you, we, we don't know. Uh, what I think we can say is that uh, Stan uses a, a genre in which this potentiality are presented. And instead, in history, these potentialities, that, pe that is, the practice of having to thought about how things could have gone otherwise and then effectively excising this reflection from the text. You know, that's what happens. So these potentialities are uh, erased. So I was thinking about, again, in terms of uh, difference in genres, it's not that uh, uh, Stan's uh, science fiction is fictional in the sense of, of not being true. I mean, again, we don't know. Uh, I would rather say that uh, it would be impossible to write the narratives that he's writing as a historian, because uh, in the sense that if uh, writing history, you know, put, put it very simply, is the, a practice of putting together narratives that connect things, you know, pieces of evidence, then uh, there are a lot of uh, pieces of evidence in this book that one could not follow as as a historian. So for instance, um, Galileo uh, throughout the book experiences, you know, does this kind of uh, time travel and, and, and also spatial travel. When he comes back, he, experience, he, he, he has experienced this, uh, this travel in terms of a dream, but effectively the people around him, they have just seen Galileo fall to the ground and have a seizure. Okay. So this is uh, the, uh, when Galileo comes back from the first trip to the moons of Jupiter, you know, this is the, the, the passage that uh, follows the one that uh, Stan had written, uh, had read before. He walked lying on the ground next to his spyglass. The stool uh, tipped over beside him. 
The night sky was lightening in the east, and Mazzolini was tugging at his shoulder. Maestro, you should go to bed. What? You were in some kind of trance. I came out before, but I couldn't wake you. I, I had a dream, I think. It seemed more like a trance, one of your syncopies. Maybe so. So, the, uh, again, this is, to, to go back to, to, to the, 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 the difference in genre, so effectively as a historian, you can't say that Stan is creating fiction. It's simply that the only evidence that one could have to write Stan's narrative as a history of science would have been to be able to follow Galileo, which you can't. So as a historian, you just see Galileo's body uh, uh, being uh, um, um, taken over by a, a, a seizure. So uh, I would say that um, if, uh, you know, to, in order to write uh, Galileo's dream as history of science, effectively, there are only two possibilities. One would have been to be Galileo and write uh, your own autobiography, or being Stan. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming today. I'd like to thank Don, Wayne, uh, for setting this up, and Mario and Kim, who I've never met before. Uh, but uh, I think today was unique for me because it's the first time ever in my life, um, uh, as, as I told Kim, I bought his book recently, and this is the first time I've ever had the author of a book ruin the ending of his own book. And I appreciate that. That's a unique thing for me. So if I can get the uh, presentation up. So many of you know that... Uh, this is the 400th anniversary of the telescope, and we've created this world year of astronomy, and as Mario spoke to the other day, people have been celebrating this for at least three years. So uh, the 400th anniversary uh, of three different years, apparently. But what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is a subtitle for which could be uh, the legacy of Galileo today, and, and seeing beyond what he was capable of seeing, but using technology that uh, is credited to him. Uh, obviously, uh, Mario is uh, much more a scholar as to the origins of the telescope and the intellectual property associated with the telescope. But in uh, conventional circles, uh, he was the first one to train it to the night sky to do uh, astronomical research with it. And the first telescope I'll talk about is a Galilean telescope. It's a refracting telescope, which my colleagues and I uh, have built at the South Pole. And what's interesting about this telescope is that uh, it really could not happen without a Galilean underpinning. It could not happen uh, and be as sensitive as it is without being of uh, the Galilean design, namely a refractor. So I'll be talking about that. And the main goal of what we're trying to do with this telescope is to study uh, the, the, the light signature, the heat left over from the Big Bang. And it's a relatively complex subject, and, and of course we've been hearing a lot about uh, uh, very complex uh, science fiction. Uh, of course, there's a lot of scientific fact uh, in, in Kim's writing, as, as, as I uh, undoubtedly appreciate. But um, I, I, won't, uh, I won't spend too much time on the motivation or the underpinnings in, uh, uh, of the science of the cosmology that we're doing with uh, the telescope that we have at the South Pole. Instead, I'll highlight some of the unique features that are invent that Galileo, as I say, uh, was the first to train it towards the night sky. Of course, we're not looking at the night sky in the visible light as Galileo did. Instead, we're using microwave vision. We're using uh, a radio telescope, in fact. And it's interesting, in, in, in fact, to note that a radio telescope can be made of a Galilean design. To some people, that's, that's quite unusual. How could it be that uh, you can see through with radio waves using the same types of materials that Galileo himself used? So I'll explain somewhat of the design, but, but the basic uh, synopsis of what I'm talking about today uh, is shown here. And this is a, a first of many space-time diagrams. Uh, what we see today is more familiar. It's the, these structures here, galaxies and stars and the mature universe that we believe today to be 
13.7 billion years old. It's actually pretty interesting. We know this with an uncertainty of one digit in the last uh, decimal place, so we, we know it to plus or minus 100 million years. And that would be like knowing, being able to guess the year uh, or, or within six months of somebody who's 70 years old to guess exactly which month in the history of the world they were born. So knowing that, I know it certainly more accurately than I know uh, most people's birthdays and birth years. So uh, we know this with fantastic precision, and this comes from studying the microwave background uh, by my predecessors and, and the hard work of theorists, um, as well as experimentalists uh, uh, such as myself. And I'll explain some of, the, uh, some of our understanding and how it's developed, but today we live here and we believe the universe began in what's called a hot Big Bang. Uh, which is to say that all the matter and radiation in the universe was compacted together in a small volume of space. And that Big Bang took place, in a sense, everywhere in the universe and created space as the universe aged. So um, uh, to talk about that you know, might require uh, a even more uh, eloquent language than I'm capable of. Maybe I'll have Kim help, uh, uh, help me out to explain it. But in essence, what we're looking is we're using the fact, as Galileo did, uh, to use the telescope as, as both a means to transport yourself in space to become closer to an object, but also in time. So when I look out into the audience, I see people not as they are exactly at this moment, at this instant. I'm seeing them a few billionths of a second after the light left their face and came to me. So we're seeing things back farther and farther in time the more we look back and back in space. And that's the key notion for the cosmology that we do today. And the theory, the, the belief is, if we look back to where there's nothing in our way, uh, nothing obstructing the view, we can see back to the beginning of light. When light, was cr when, when light first came into existence, namely the Big Bang, and, and shortly thereafter, uh, we can see everything that's happened since then, and that's what we use the microwave background radiation for. It's the famous three Kelvin uh, uh, microwave background. So we, we call it a light echo or heat relic of the Big Bang, and we believe that the galaxies and stars that we see today trace themselves to a primordial uh, soup of material, uh, namely the first stars and proto-galaxies that have reformed, my colleague Mike Norman's in the back, and he's, uh, he's developed computer codes and, and algorithms that basically he calls a computer uh, universe in a box where he can simulate uh, billions of particles, billion, uh, uh, billions of particles and, and simulate the creation of these objects which then later grow into these objects. But what I study is this object here, this is the microwave background, the cosmic microwave background radiation, and it's the heat left over from the Big Bang. And in a sense, this is the limit of our vision. We can't go any farther back in time using light or radio waves or x-rays. This is where our vision stops. But it's not where time started, it's actually occurring, this heat was imprinted 380,000 years after the Big Bang. So there's no way just by using light that we can look any, any farther back in time than this region here. But we know that this pattern must have been established by an earlier epoch, which we call inflation. And this happened in an extremely bizarre uh, uh, stage of the universe's development when it was a few fractions, quanta of time old. And I certainly won't have time to get into our understanding of what that, that sentence really means. But essentially, this I term the spark that lit the Big Bang, that then became uh, this explosive expansion, uh, the relics in both heat and light we still see today. So this is sort of the rough uh, overarching view and, uh, of, of the cosmology that I'm going to attempt to describe and how we came to the understanding that we have today and how we're going to probe deeper uh, by understanding this event, this epoch in the universe's history, not by using light, but by using gravity. We hope to be able to understand this epoch that took place before and led to it. So as I said, the uh, CMB itself is, these, is this thermal background. As Mario was saying, you know, paleontologists are lucky. They have these dinosaur bones. They can recreate, maybe using their own fictional imagination, what kind of environments and make a diorama. But unfortunately, in, in, in cosmology, we only have one universe. We don't have millions of bones. We don't have millions of chemicals that we can mix together. We have one universe. And we hope to do statistical tests on that single universe. And, uh, and that makes it challenging because we only really have things that come to us, either asteroid uh, fragments, meteorites, et cetera, or light or radio waves. Uh, we hope to use gravity as well. But to date, that has not been done. So the CMB is this light uh, relic, this light fossil that's come from the early universe to us today. 
Uh, it was predicted by a uh, physicist, astrophysicist in the 30s, George Gamow and others. He predicted that if the universe began, began in a hot, dense state, that well, we would see an afterglow of that state later on that would be much, much cooler. And it would trace to the fact that the universe expands as it cools, as, uh, cools as it expands, and uh, ages, uh, as it ages, it expands. The CMB was detected by uh, these guys here, shown in a much more modern picture. And to my knowledge, this is the only cosmology experiment to ever take place in New Jersey. Uh, this is uh, the famous Bell Labs uh, telescope, uh, which doesn't really look like a telescope at all, but it's a big horn. And you'll see a lot of these when we discuss our technology today. We don't use our eyes in uh, CMB science. We use detectors that, that transduce light or radio waves, uh, capture them, amplify them, and detect them. Uh, and so we're, we're sensitive in a different way than Galileo was using his vision or photographs, as astronomers did later, and now CCD cameras, et cetera. Um, but it wasn't really understood uh, whether or not the CMB, for this picture to make sense, these structures grew out of these structures, which look more simple than these. These structures look more complicated than this structure here. And so the idea is that gravity is acting on gas and irregularities in density in the early universe, causing matter to come together. And of course, Galileo studied uh, gravity as well. And, um, and those uh, over-densities and under-densities in the universe, it was thought, would create not a perfectly smooth uh, CMB, uh, CMB uh, distribution, but in fact it would be irregular. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues, Art Wolf, in the astronomy department here, in the physics department, uh, predicted that the, there should be an anisotropy. The, the universe should not be perfectly smooth in every direction, receiving exactly three Kelvin worth of radiation. He predicted that in different regions of the sky, you'd see different values of that uh, te temperature in the universe, and that those fluctuations in temperature had the same origin as the origin of galaxy stars and clusters of stars and galaxies. So uh, we believe that pattern of irregularities today, this is a, a kind of cartoon vision of what it looks like. It's not a moon of Jupiter that uh, we don't know about. Instead, it's a globe of the sky, but projected as if you're God looking down on this uh, sphere of the sky, okay? but seen in microwave vision. Where, where blue represents overdensities of matter, where light escaping from there will be colder, and red uh, represents warmer regions of the sky. But again, this irregularity is quite small. It's only one part in 10 to the fifth, okay? So that's a part in 100,000. And what that means, just to give you an, an example, that's about how smooth this ball bearing is. The ball bearing surface relative to its radius is smooth to a part of one in 100,000. So that's pretty fantastic that we can actually see images of the microwave background that are, this, uh, that are, that, are that small. And actually, we're going to go much farther beyond that. We already have. And I'll show you some pictures of that uh, towards the end in a few minutes. So the question is, where do these fluctuations come from? And this is another uh, space-time diagram, but this I kind of call a, a particle time diagram. It's actually a stuff time diagram, because I'm showing the evolution of stuff, matter, protons, uh, photons here, helium nuclei, hydrogen nuclei, etc., and then they become atoms here. And this is when the CMB is produced. So we cannot see farther back in time, because these electrons that are here, free and unbound, act just like the surface of a mirror. They reflect any light, if you like, or they absorb any light that you try, if you were peering back from one of these structures here, you would not be able to see beyond here because you're essentially looking at a surface of a mirror. It's only when these electrons combine with protons to make hydrogen that we become uh, uh, transparent to uh, be able to see from now today to this surface. But you can never use light to see any farther back than this time here, which is 380,000 years, I said, after the Big Bang. And we're down here, 13.7 billion years. Okay. And another way to visualize this is if today, you know, today uh, is, is the beginning of May, but usually in May in San Diego, if you're not from here, Mario, uh, and, and, and Kim lives in nor more northern California, we have May gray, okay? Uh, and May gray is an overcast layer. And if you're on the ground, you can't use light to see anything beyond the surface of the overcast as you see it above you. You can't see if there's a plane flying up there or perhaps there's an explosion of some kind up there with light. You can't see that. But you could hope to see an explosion, the impact of that explosion, maybe on the cloud layer by using the sound or maybe hearing the, the explosion. You could trace that back to, uh, to better understand what was the source of that explosion? What was the source of those perturbations? 
And that's exactly what we're trying to do with the microwave background radiation. And as shown here, here we are in the present, we're looking back, here's the surface of last scattering. We can't use our eyes to see any farther back in time. But perhaps we can use the properties of, gal of gravity that later grew out and perturbed the surface to make it as irregular uh, as a ball bearing, as I showed before. So this is sort of the, the brief overview of the theory. I won't talk too much more about it. I'll, I'm happy when we have our question to answer it. But this is the, is there a way to bring down the spotlight a little bit, just so people can see. So this is bicep. There's our tattooed uh, model over here. Uh, no, that's not me. Um, and uh, this is a, uh, uh, as I said, this is a Galilean refracting telescope, but not for light, for microwaves. So microwave radiation would come in from here, if this were a microwave, and then this is a, uh, a lens cap, really, it's really to keep this, this, this system cold. And we're trying to keep this cold because we're looking for a small fluctuation in the background radiation, which itself is near absolute zero. It's only three degrees above absolute zero. So this is a picture of the telescope and its mount, uh, and it's a 30 centimeter diameter telescope, 18 inches or so, uh, size lens. And uh, thanks, you can bring back up the light if you like. Uh, so this is a schematic diagram of how the telescope looks, and I told you you'd see more funnels. These are our funnels, and I, I call this uh, not even good enough to be a one milli megapixel camera. In other words, a megapixel is a million pixels. We have 50 pixels, and the reason is uh, our CCD cameras in your in your phone, uh, in your in your in your camera, those uh, can have millions of pixels because the wavelength that you're looking at is visible optical light. And those are approximately half a micron in diameter, um, and uh, half of a uh, half of a millionth of a meter wavelength. What we're looking for, in contradistinction, is two millimeter wavelength and longer, one to two to three millimeter wavelengths and longer. So the so the size of the pixel in your CCD camera correlates to the size of the light light's wavelength that you're looking at. We're looking at microwaves, so these are really physically sized objects. As I said, we're trying to see a heat signature, a very tiny fluctuation on top of something which is almost an absolute zero to begin with. So the only way to do that is for us to cool our detectors below the temperature of the signal itself. So we're looking for something approximately three degrees Kelvin, plus or minus very minuscule fluctuations, parts in 100,000 or parts in a million or even parts in a billion of that. So we cool our detectors down to 0.25 kel Kelvin, 250 milliDegrees Kelvin. And those detectors are ultra-sensitive uh, semiconductor detectors, which I'll show you a quick picture of. I won't go into too much of the details of it, because I do want to talk mostly about why we put it where we, where we put this telescope at the South Pole. That's what most people want to know. So here's a cutaway. Light comes in, as I showed. It gets refracted and bent to different spatial places on, on, the, uh, on the array. We only have 50 of them here. And uh, these are these little funnels, which actually do just that. They funnel light, concentrate it, so that we can amplify this minuscule signal traveling over the entire course of the universe's history. So if you're a photon, this is the last thing you ever see after your 13.7 billion year long life. <laughs> you crash into one of these depending on where you are on the sky, okay, and when we're looking at you. Okay, so this is what BICEP looks like. Now, where should we put this telescope? Well, one thought, and people always ask, is why not put it you know, closer to home in San Diego? I mean, the South Pole is nice, but we have pretty awesome weather here, despite this, the May gray. Uh, and so here's a picture of Palomar, which is uh, in San Diego County. And uh, Palomar sort of came out of use for many different reasons. It's a very large diameter telescope. It's a Newtonian reflecting telescope. But one of the reasons is that San Diego's light was, becoming encro was encroaching on the ability of scientists, astronomers, to take, to take sensitive images from here using photographic plates. So this is polluted by light. Now they're looking for light. So light to them, extra light, is a pollution source. For us, heat is a pollution. We're looking for heat. We can do our observations during the day. We could do it in a city, as long as there's not radio or microwave or excess thermal heat. So one reason we, we go somewhere cold is to get away from the background of of heat that's unavoidable on Earth. On Earth, we're roughly 300 degrees above absolute zero, pretty much all, uh, in most locations in the, on the Earth's surface. And we're looking for something 100 times colder and small fluctuations on top of that. So uh, we find, for us, the analog of being dark for an optical telescope is to have a very dry atmosphere. Water absorbs microwaves. We're trying to absorb these precious microwaves that came from the Big Bang. They've been traveling forever. 
for the, literally the entire duration of the universe, and we don't want to miss any of them. And I'm showing here a little chemical description of what's actually happening to inside your microwave oven. Your microwave oven operates on wavelengths about 10 times longer than the ones I'm using, but nevertheless, the principle is the same. Water absorbs microwaves. It causes them to rotate. Uh, the microwave radiation causes the molecules to rotate, which is what warms them up by friction, essentially. And that's how you can eat uh, or, or drink a cup of coffee, uh, which would be hot, but the cup handle doesn't burn you if it's made of ceramic because the ceramic is dry. So we want to go somewhere extremely dry, and we picked South Pole in Antarctica. So I'm going to show you a little, a little uh, travelogue here, and, uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll show you how we installed it, and I'll show you some of our data, which we recently released, and it's really quite exciting to be a part of the team that has done this, because we've made essentially the deepest images of the early universe that have ever been made. Uh, so we chose to go to Antarctica, and here's a picture of Antarctica. These are the most famous residents of Antarctica, and they're walking to work. And then we can see that actually it seems to be quite inhospitable. But uh, we found uh, an, an awful lot of great support here, and this is a little travelogue movie of, of what you do. You go down to New Zealand and you pick up your clothes, you pick up your boarding pass. There's actually boarding passes to get on this plane here. This is a C-17, U.S. Air Force C-17 from Washington State. We fly down from our high altitude. We can start to see icebergs after about three hours. We land. This is a super shuttle uh, for Antarctica. We take this into town. This is a freeway in Antarctica. Uh, this goes to McMurdo Station, which looks like this. This looks like a college campus uh, and a mining town. There's a Wells Fargo ATM down there. Good for us Californians. There's a, two bars down there. This is a non-smoking bar you can go into. It's very clean. This is the smoking bar. It's much darker, and your vision gets very blurry when you're there. This is, this is an, <laughs> a snapshot of the activities going on there. Okay, so you sleep off the last night's activities, and you get on this aircraft here. It's a C-130 with skis, and you fly to the South Pole. It takes about three hours. And these are some telescopes there. I want you to remember this image. This is our passenger terminal at the South Pole, okay? <laughs> Now, we got there in a couple of hours. This is Scott's party. He got there uh, over the course of three months and died on the way back. We get to stay here uh, in a place that has a kitchen and a greenhouse. And this is, this. This is just the sous chef at the South Pole today. It's a fantastic place to be able to go to to uh, do science. I'll show you. Uh, let me go back a little bit in the movie. I just think it's so funny that this person is here as a sous chef. Uh, so, and it says here, I read about her, she's been a personal chef to Heather Graham and Liv Tyler. And she's not even our main chef, she's just a sous chef. So Kim had it harder when he was there, he, he stayed in the actual South Pole Dome, which you can't see is over here, the famous dome. This, this uh, new station cost about a quarter of a billion dollars, but it's actually doing fantastic research, and um, it's a wonderful facility. And it's not just for the U.S., it's for all 14 countries or so that uh, do astronomy, or do science from Antarctica of all kinds. So you go there, you take your picture in front of here, that's, that's your hero shot. You know, it took you three hours to get there, and it took the other guys months and they die coming back, and you can do it almost like a ski trip. And then this is a shot of us going to work. Uh, we walk across the runway, looking both ways, uh, for incoming uh, C-130s. And this is called the dark sector of Antarctica because there's no radio, uh, no radios allowed out there that aren't essential because all these telescopes are radio telescopes. Our telescope is here. And now it's over there. And these are other different types of our, our colleagues and their radio telescope. Now look at this thing here. That looks kind of familiar, I would say. That is a shot of the, whoops, let me go back to this. Yeah. So this, if you remember, looks just like the South Pole passenger terminal, but it's actually our outhouse. Uh, there's no bathrooms up here. And nowadays, all the buildings are built up on stilts because of uh, blowing snow that comes in. A lot of people wonder, why do we put the sensitive telescope up on a shaky foundation? But it's actually quite a strong foundation, and it prevents wind from doing too much uh, disturbances to our telescopes. Our telescope's in here. That, that uh, large instrument that I showed you, uh, the Galilean refractor, is inside of here. And we uh, do observations. We can look all over the sky. And it's interesting to note that this telescope here uh, is called the South Pole Telescope. This is a $20 million telescope, uh, University of Chicago, Berkeley, and others. But this telescope, this gigantic Newtonian reflecting telescope, 
has the exact same sensitivity to what we're looking for as we do. Because the signature of what we're looking for is actually very, very coarse angular resolution. And I'll show you some images of that uh, upcoming. So that's the uh, travel log for, for, for the, uh, to get to the telescope. These are our detectors. Uh, we, we have two different microfabricated uh, detectors per pixel. So we actually have 100 detectors and 50 spatial pixels. Uh, these are cooled to a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. They're little resistors whose electrical resistance for the experts changes as a function of their thermal, uh, as a function of their temperature. So they're called thermistors, and they're extremely sensitive. They're the most sensitive detectors for this type of work that you can, uh, can build physically. Uh, here's the telescope again. Uh, so that is now inside of that larger scoop. And the scoop outside, this scoop is not uh, the telescope itself. It's to prevent heat from coming in from here and, getting in, and seeing this, uh, the, the front of our telescope and getting in. So it's a type of baffle, really. So there's a telescope. This is us installing it. Uh, this is the cooled part, which uh, the innards of which are cooled down to a quarter of a degree above absolute zero. And these are some scenes around uh, the South Pole after we installed it inside of here. So these are the images that I wanted to show you. I'll kind of flip back and forth. Uh, no one has ever seen the universe in its primitive state and its baby pictures any clearer than this. These are images that we took over two years of uninterrupted observations. And those observations allowed us to make these ultra-deep images at two different wavelengths. And the, and the two different wavelengths are important because uh, they have different angular resolutions. But if you uh, observe them together, you can see if you're being contaminated by any other sources of uh, contamination. So the, the two different maps agree perfectly. And that's extremely exciting. So this is a baby picture of the universe. And these dark spots will later grow into super clusters of galaxies, or they actually already have, uh, if, if, uh, if they remained un undisturbed. So this is an extremely high fidelity, thanks to the clean design of the Galilean refractor. The Galilean refractor is just like a spotting scope. There's nothing between your eye and what you're looking at, in our case, the early universe. There's no other mirrors, like with a, with a Newtonian telescope or a Cassegrain telescope, uh, that can be used to distort or corrupt the image that we're looking at. That being said, uh, here's a nice picture taken by uh, one of the uh, scientists that we paid a winter over at the South Pole. Uh, we, we ha we, the scientists leave after a couple of weeks or a couple of months and go back to wherever their home institution is. And we have, there are about 40 people that live uh, at that big station over the summer. And what's nice about that is that uh, they, they, they get paid pretty healthy salaries. They get about $70,000. Uh, and we tell them you only have to work for one night because uh, there's only one sunrise and sunset per year in Antarctica, and they keep falling for it. This is actually the moon, and when the moon is out, uh, they actually call that sunrise, because in the winter down there, there's absolutely no other sources of light. This is probably taken in July, uh, when the temperatures go down to about 100 degrees Fahrenheit, below zero. So this is uh, a summary of our experiment. Now, this is an, a, a trip that we took to, a, to a, the only working telescope in California that does this type of science. This is called the Polar Bear Telescope. And this is me and a friend flying up the Owens Valley uh, to visit the telescope, which is uh, located near Bishop, California. And it's a collaboration between UCSD and UC Berkeley, Colorado University, um, and a few other institutions scattered all over the world. And this telescope is built in, uh, in the Owens Valley, uh, not as its final uh, observing location, but instead it's built there so that we can uh, test it before we take it down to a higher and better site in Chile. This is the actual Owens Valley itself. We're flying up it. We're going to land around here, and then we're going to drive up to the telescope. This is Owens Lake. It's actually quite beautiful. You're all invited uh, to come visit. We land at Bishop Airport. And then we make, start making the drive up the mountain. This is only located at 7,200 feet above uh, sea level. It's not that high. It's, not, it's lower than the South Pole. But it's equidistant from Berkeley and UCSD, and so it makes it very convenient for us to test the telescope before we ship it. So uh, it's very beautiful. This is the Inyo National Forest. It's quite a luxurious, beautiful place to work. Uh, after you've been to the South Pole and you have a room that you can touch both sides of the walls with your arms outstretched. Then we uh, drive to the telescope facility itself. It's also the home of the uh, Owens Valley Radio Observatory's KARMA telescope array. That's this structure here. Those are an interferometer. 
And this is the Polar Bear Telescope. Uh, after we finished construction of it, there's some of my students on it, and we're calibrating it. So this is a reflecting telescope, but the reason I wanted to show this to you is because this we used to observe the planet Jupiter. So Jupiter is used in microwave uh, uh, astronomy as a source of calibration. We know its temperature exactly. We've had space probes there. Uh, perhaps Galileo himself was actually there, if Kim is right. Uh, so we know the physical conditions absolutely, and we know what they'll produce in terms of a signal if we look at it. And that's the definition of how you calibrate your telescope. You have a known signal that you're sending in, and then you measure a signal coming out. So this is kind of our postcard picture. We have a blog, mountainpolarbear.blogspot.com. And uh, we have a YouTube video of it moving around. It's quite impressive. It weighs about 75,000 pounds, and it can slew and view the whole sky in just a few seconds and track it very accurately. But again, it's not a Newtonian telescope. So what I do want to show you, here's the famous uh, uh, Galileo, and he's staring up at Jupiter and uh, one of the Galilean moons. And I want to show you an image of Jupiter unlike anything you've ever seen before, certainly unlike Galileo ever had the opportunity to see. Okay, So this is Jupiter seen through microwave eyes. Pretty spectacular. <laughs> So with our microwave detectors, we only see one bit of information at a given time. So we build up images. This is Jupiter passing through a couple of weeks ago for the first time ever seeing Jupiter with our telescope called First Light. It's a very exciting time for astronomers. And then we can synthesize many of them together to make an image like this, which has some distortions. It's not because of the moons or uh, we're not accidentally looking at Saturn. Instead, uh, we, have a, we have looked at Saturn, but this is not it. Uh, this is due to how we process the data and their uh, artifacts. So we're learning how these detectors work, brand new detectors, brand new uh, telescope. And eventually we'll be in Chile, uh, but for now we're in California, so it's quite nice to have this telescope working here. And I'll leave with this final image of us at daybreak uh, commemorating our first light observations. So thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so, um, so actually, kind of uh, going off of of, uh, of Brian's presentation, um, I, I wanted to just draw one aspect out of, of the Galileo's Dream book and the um, the use of. What's one of the things that science fiction allowed um, Stan to bring to that story? Was actually a very, um, uh, one, uh, a very clear description of of issues at stake in contemporary physics, and in particular physics that start to completely change the way we, uh, uh, you know, uh, daily think about the re about time, and of course it's a time travel book, so that's a, a part of a part of this a part of the story, um, but these kind of uh, physical, these contemporary uh, physical physics theories about uh, time and its complexity uh, are, are likely as destabilizing to our, view, our current world view as Galileo's uh, ideas about advocating for the Copernican uh, uh, system were to his time. And, um, and so I, I, I wanted to um, uh, ask Brian ab about that aspect of the book and the ability of fiction and science fiction in particular to engage these kinds of contemporary physical theories. Yeah, um, it might be. Oh, I hear Take this. Okay. 
So um, how, how, do, how does science fiction, or concepts in science fiction, advance our notions or, or, or blend with our notions of, of time? I found I'm um, only on chapter three uh, in the book, um, and uh, I've, I've had it for three days now. But uh, but actually, it's quite um, uh, quite interesting to me that the blend of of uh, the historical science fact and the the intuition that Galileo had, not necessarily in terms of time travel, and I don't think that's going to be a theme. I haven't, as I said, I haven't finished it. But the the theme that spoke loudest to me was of the invention and the collaboration, but also a little bit of the, of the, of the childlike aspect of, of science, which I, I think it was Bohr who said that, you know, an experimentalist, who Galileo was, is kind of like a child. Um, he'll complete, he or she will complete, uh, keep doing the same experiment over and over again, unlike a normal person, or an adult, say, because an adult will do it once, get some result, like it, dislike it, but move on. But a child will keep doing the same result because it, gets, it gives them a little spark of the taste of the pleasure they felt when they did it the first time. And I kind of feel like that, was, uh, that, that resonated with me, that Galileo would keep, he, he almost didn't believe his invention. He almost was not capable of, uh, uh, it, was, it was so thrilling to him. And it reminded me a little bit of the descriptions of Einstein when he was meditating on time. And, um, you know, of course, Galilean, we speak of Galileo and Einstein together in what's called relativity. There's a Galilean relativity where time is absolute, and then there's an Einsteinian relativity where time is fluid. Time is relative to the observer's state of motion or, or fixed nature. So I, I would say, you know, Galileo is, is that paradigm of the classical, you know, Renaissance, that time was absolute, space was absolute, and... Um, and, and how we've uh, modified and advanced in the neoclassical and modern period is that we have fluid notions of space and time that have been developed. Stan, do you want to say something about the yeah. concepts of time in the book? And sure. The uh, string, and Brian, uh, you can tell me if I'm getting this right, but string theory, which is this uh, uh, the edge of current uh, speculative physics and cosmology with the notion that um, the universe might be constructed of smallest possible objects, uh, these strings that are vibrating and that their um, size is essentially the minimum size, which is something crossing the speed of light, crossing the Pauli exclusion principle in that essentially two very small particles can't occupy the same space. And so they will be a certain a minimum distance apart, 10 to the negative 34th of a meter. That's really small. So it only takes 10 to the negative 43rd of a second for light to cross that interval. And these are minima. You can't get lower than that, or you break the standard model of physics as we understand it. But these things are so small that we cannot experimentally find them or not. They're, they're theoretical objects only. And like the cyclotron that they have under Geneva, uh, it gets things up to a certain energy before they, they collide together, these small particles. If you were to just take proportionally a cyclotron that would be big enough to reveal these string size objects, it would be as big around as the galaxy. So we can't build that cyclotron and we can't as far as we know, investigate strings. But we have done an experiment to show some entanglement, which is something happening, uh, spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called it. And they have experimentally confirmed that you can um, charge the spin factor of a, of a subatomic particle in one place, and due to the laws of complementarity, and believe me, I'm speaking as an English major here, and they are just metaphors as far as I'm concerned. Nevertheless, there is a law of complementarity that if you give a spin to one um, particle, there is an opposite particle that immediately takes the opposite spin, no matter how far it, away it is. So the information for the first one has been conveyed to the second one simultaneously across space. And so they've done it on two of the opposite sides of France, and uh, at faster than light. This has been proven by experiment, and therefore entanglement seems to be real. 
This is my complete justification for my 31st century physics. Uh, string theorists will say, well, for all this to work out mathematically in the most beautiful way possible, which I don't know what that means, uh, there would have to be 10 dimensions, and I don't know what that means either. But then they're also saying that we're only seeing 5 to 10 percent of the mass of the universe as lit material, and there's dark matter. There's also suddenly the realization that the universe is apparently expanding at speed rather than being pulled in by its own gravity. Dark energy, dark energy, dark matter. I'm getting the impression that we are completely at sea in terms of the true nature of the universe and that we live in uh, three dimensions of space, one of time, that we understood this space-time continuum a little bit in the Einsteinian sense. We're still basically Newtonian, but we could at least comprehend the notion of Einsteinian, uh, Einsteinian space. But this 10-dimensional space, what's the sixth? What's the seventh? What's the eighth? Well, if for, if for my purposes, writing a novel, I could just simply say that by the 31st century, they'd managed to work out some math and some, and some experiments to confirm, like this entanglement experiment, experiment which we've already uh, accomplished, to confirm some of these things and say that dark matter is really just another name for a, another one of the 10 dimensions. Dark energy, a name for another 10 dimension. At a certain point, I could just go hog wild. Nobody knows. Nobody knows at this point. But it's interesting that actually uh, one of the fathers of modern string theory, Ed Witten, at the uh, Institute for Advanced Study, he said things to the nature of that uh, the influence of physics, much like Newton and Galileo, was that they influenced and created new mathematics. And now what they're saying is that string theory is mathematics not of the 31st century, but the 22nd century. Mm. I happen to think it's of the 31st century. I think you're right. Um, it's very difficult for an experimentalist to see a theory that can't be tested. Yeah. So, uh, but you are right. It is that it's been spoken that it is advanced math that we don't know. We only know the contours of the mathematics at this point. We don't know the details. I have Galileo saying, well, this is just the end of physics when the situation is described to him, uh, the end of experimental physics. But, and it may be true. In fact, there are books out there, the end of physics, the end of science, that we reach limits to what we can even try to understand. Yeah. And, you know, I was just checking the time, and I um, wanted to include the audience uh, if there were uh, questions from the audience for the panel. Anybody yet in front? Just to break the ice, what is the um, refractor lens made of? Uh, now you'll have to. Seems like it's almost right. It's actually made of Teflon, polyeth high density polyethylene. The same thing that milk bottles used to be made of, and then we coat it with a type of Teflon. I have a question to follow up with that one. Um, it looked like on the, the sense of the tubes that are collecting the, the particles, um, there were a bunch of different size tubes, different mm -hmm. diameters. Yes. Uh, why? Yeah, so those are for the, uh, to collect different types of, uh, different wavelengths of light. So I said the size of your CCD camera is dictated by the wavelength of light. So we want to see two different wavelengths of light, except they're radio waves at these frequencies. So those are in the funnels themselves. Those, those are called corrugated microwave feed horns. They basically collect light of different frequencies. And I actually wanted to, uh, to congratulate Kim on his description of the refractor as Galileo uh, described the different properties of the lenses. And, and that's, uh, if, if you read the, the, those, those beginning chapters, you'll see a blend of his intuition and his experimentation, which I thought was very well done. Although he may, as Mario has pointed out, have lied about all of that <laughs> after the fact. Uh, I, I wish that I had known what Mario has discovered in this last year in the record, uh, that Galileo may have actually seen a model of the telescope, so he didn't back engineer it by brilliance alone, but perhaps just looked at one and went home and reproduced it, which is kind of funny and would have made a great scene. Not, it, the, it, in general, the, the, the truth of a situation is more interesting than a simpler story that you make up. And True science fiction. Yes. Yeah. I have two questions. Um, first of all, the, the uh, polar bear telescope that's going to Chile, what's the reason for Chile receiving that? And then secondly, the information that you gather from the telescopes, is it shared equally between those 14 countries? 
So um, the reason we're going to Chile um, is because we want to be above the atmospheric water contamination. Same reason we go to the South Pole. But having been to the South Pole and trying to do science there, it's very challenging uh, to get materials in and out of there. And as I said, if you're not on the flight that leaves February 15th, you're there until November. And I've got teaching and a wife and <laughs> all those things. So you don't want to be there, but that it's nice in one sense, it makes you discipline. The other sense that's bad is that you can't really, there's no room for error. Chile, we can get FedEx basically overnight or one, you know, two day delivery. So we're gonna go there, it's just as high quality a site. In some ways it might be superior. There's a religious war going on between Chile versus South Pole. Uh, I won't get into it, but after uh, next, when I'm back to speak about that, maybe we can talk about that. But but the uh, as far as the data shared between the 14 countries, those 14 countries are the countries that uh, signed the Antarctica Treaty, which prevents them from exploring for gold and uh, drilling for oil and things like that on the continent and testing nuclear weapons. So they're signatories to the treaty, but we don't. Um, they can stay in the South Pole uh, Station, which is built entirely by the U.S. But um, each experiment is autonomous uh, within that. So they do experiments there on the atmosphere and other types of experiments. We don't participate in those. And other countries do their own experiments there. I had a philosophical question. Uh, Kim talked about you know, projecting into the future in order to sort of avoid the problem of we haven't quite figured it out yet. And Brian says, yes, it might be the end of science. But Mario, as a, as a science historian, would you see what they're talking about, and, and not soon, not, not in a hundred years, but someday will you, or your colleagues of the future, sort of have written the history of science much as someone has probably written the definitive history of buggy whips? You know, that in fact, will we, in a, a, a thousand years, in fact, at the current rate of discovery, perhaps find you know, everyone projects, everyone says, oh, we've, you can't discover any more things. There aren't any more things to discover. But in some sense, at the levels of, of particles that Kim was talking about, you're physically prevented from discovering more things. And do, you, do you, any of you see that, you know, science or art or other things may cease to pro progress? You know, and, and this would be, I think, a tragedy. But, you know, what will we find to do if we can't do science, for example? One thing that uh, I've noticed, you know, about the, you know, beliefs in the, in the end of science, actually, I mean, the ones that I've seen tend to come from scientists themselves. And they tend to be associated with, uh, so in the early modern period, you know, Bacon and Descartes. You know, basically the idea is that, you know, once you got the right method, right, I mean, if it's the right method, then it's just a matter of applying the right method and, you know, uh, so if you read, uh, you know, Descartes, you know, he thinks that uh, if uh, he got the right amount of money, he could have figured out everything in a matter of years. And you have the same kind of, kind of insane optimism in Bacon. They basically say, you know, look, you know, we got the method, now it's just a matter of funding. Give us the funding and it's going to be done very quickly. So the, the, the beliefs in the end of science actually tend to be associated with uh, overconfident statements about methods. Mm -hmm. and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're beliefs by the scientists, not by you know, the critics. Mm -hmm. so, it's about the possibility of you know, future history of science, probably, you know, I believe that you know, maybe in a few years we'll not be able to do anything because you know, everything will be covered by trade secrets or intellectual property that we will not be able to have access to the sources. Maybe when we <clears throat> stop running out of new plot lines for science fiction novels, <laughs> we'll have you know, completed the end of science and the end of art. David has another question. Um, well, uh, I, I, I don't think we're going to run out of science fiction ideas very soon, um, but uh, then again, I have my own biases in that direction. But it, it is telling that um, Stan and I and a number of other people have moved away from um, some of the classic furniture of science fiction, and that is warp drive, Star Trek type things. I still do that now and then. Stan forswore that. He's more honest than I long ago. Um, but when we feel we're actually playing with the net up, 
we tend to move away from some of those child put away the childish things but i wanted to ask this is a this is a work in which i think it's very important to make a distinction between three kinds of things that you're doing stan and i want your comment on this and one is um where the reader can say, I am reading this book, and here in this passage, I am getting an artful, fictionalized representation of things that I can then take home as probably what happened, according to the best information. Area two is, I get a feeling now that this is when Stan is extrapolating and I, as a reader, am fine with that. Mm -hmm. And now I'm getting to a point where this is Stan and me having fun together. And we're going off where it's clearly not true, but it, is, it, it has a more artistic truth. And I have read many novels in which this attempt, this attempt to be fair by somehow signaling that you're in this area now, you're in this area now, you're in this area now, is a total failure. I, I'm, I'm thinking of Ada by Nabokov, where he doesn't bother trying to let you know um, which of these territories you're in or where the world split. And I'm wondering if, if you were thinking along these lines at all, these three different w modes. Yes, I definitely was, David. There, I wanted to uh, present uh, uh, Galileo's own history in a way that didn't distort it into something else. Because the story as itself is interesting, important, it has its own integrity. There was no reason to mess with it being such a great story. But I thought it would be interesting to th suggest really powerfully that what happened to Galileo was achieved by him as against some worse fates that could have happened. When I read that Giordano Bruno was burned at the stake when Galileo was 36 years old and a working professor in Padua, I had not, in my ignorance, put together the timing there to realize that this was something happening in his lifetime and could have happened to him. So that um, he escaped a worse fate in the trial and he needed to work towards escaping getting burned at the stake. So this is the great act of science fiction. You can then, you can then uh, physicalize the alternative so that in one of the chapters, one of the alternative uh, presents that Galileo was negotiating, he does get burned at the stake. It's kind of an awful scene. Um, and then the other thing, I was reading the Renaissance literature itself to get the, the uh, sense of the times. And they're always fooling around with these elements. There's a lot of fantasy in Renaissance literature. There's a great book called uh, Hypnerotica Machia, The Strife of Love in a Dream, uh, 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 an Italian, it's a somewhat soft porn, but it's also just a, a kind of gigantic uh, um, science fiction romance, which is a new, well, we think of it as a new kind of horrible compound genre that it's doing very well right now. But in fact, uh, there it was in, um, in the, um, say, 1590, the same thing, beautifully illustrated and privately published. So. I felt the playfulness uh, possible. I had been such a, a realist, a rather conservative science fiction writer. No faster than light travel, no aliens that could talk, and no time travel for sure, because all those things are impossible. And at that point, you're off into the realm of fantasy rather than science fiction. And then at a certain point, when I had this notion of Galileo flying through his telescope off to Jupiter, I thought, well, why not? I mean, why, why be conservative? Why be realistic? I'm already a science fiction writer. I'm tagged with wild craziness already by my genre definition. And yet here I am playing, hard science fiction writers talk about playing with the net up. Like otherwise it's tennis with the net down. You can just do any damn thing you please. And that's most of science fiction and fantasy. But hard science fiction plays with the net up. Although, as I always point out, there's also a handy dandy device that shrinks the tennis ball that goes right through the net at any point <laughs> when you want it to. So I thought, well, I want to play that game too. The novel seemed to demand it. And uh, it was a great pleasure. And there have been people commenting about hand waving. Uh, the reviews of the book says there's some vigorous hand waving by Robinson when it comes to time travel. Well, of course. I mean, how else are you going to explain it? But there's hand waving and there's hand waving. If you think about those Indonesian hand dancers, then maybe hand waving isn't quite so bad. There can be some style involved in the sentences created. 
There's a couple more questions, and uh, Don and, and over here. Uh, well, um, the hand waving is, is certainly elegant, and uh, and so was Brian's presentation of his research. Um, the elegance is really itself uh, very interesting to me. Um, because there's a formal aspect to uh, both Stan's novel and the way in which time is, is, is treated in the novel and to the way in which Brian presented what, you, you know, your research. And I, I, I can't pretend to understand really what you're doing as a physicist, but the formal aspect of it is very interesting to me. Uh, in Stan's novel, uh, I, I sense that, you know, Mario said it's, well, it's, it's, not, it's a historical novel, but it's also a science fiction novel. and the, the, the two get collapsed, and those two categories or genres really get collapsed in a fascinating way. And there's a sense in which looking to the future, speculative culture, becomes a way of understanding, not only understanding the past, but understanding the process very differently from the way we've understood history in the past. And I have the sense that something similar is going on with Brian's research because of the technology that you have accessible to you about the past, of, you know, the history of the universe, basically. It's just an observation, and I'm, I'm not sure that it correlates. Okay, we have one more right in the middle here. Um, I, I was interested in um, the play between the visual images that um, we saw earlier and your science fiction, and if this was the first time you've done a presentation like that, or you thinking of integrating images into your books. Um, you know, no one has commented on the images, and so I was wondering, you know, how, how that's sort of central to all of your presentations in a different way. Well, for me, this is the collaboration with Sheldon. Uh, Sheldon and Todd and his crew put together the visuals. I myself have had a, a lifetime prejudice against visual images in my talks and readings, and I think of my books as books. The fact that eventually on your iPad I could begin to do the soundtrack, it gets a little overwhelming um, because I still want to uh, think of it principally as a string of sentences, and I still am a very conservative person aesthetically, uh, not politically. But. Uh, what we've done this before uh, a couple of years ago where uh, Sheldon and his team do the visuals and I can't even see them so then you're just counting on synchronicity uh, and it, it's it, I don't know I saw a little uh, web, web movie of it afterwards but the truth is I don't know whether uh, how the synchronicities work or not because I'm not seeing the visual images behind me and so I, this is for me since I would never collaborate in writing because why would you when it's the only place where you can do what you want? Um, it's neat to be able to do a collaboration that is multimedia, where it also there's an element of it that is crucial, but not your responsibility. Well, I've never had that before either. It's kind of fun. It's, it's, uh, it's fun, and, and as Stan says, we depend upon you know, luck and synchronicity, and, um, because it's, it's, the planning behind it is, is, is amazingly sparse. And, uh, you know, we kind of cast around a very general idea. We start to c c gather a cast of characters who bring other things to the table. And, uh, and then the, the visuals take actually quite a bit of effort to make. It takes a long time to make these things because the technology is still very new. And um, <clears throat> so there aren't really standard methods. Um, uh, so, so, you know, but I... You know, thinking about the images that would go with with this uh, uh, these presentations today, was to try and think about how, you know, the the you know this this effect of of Galileo extending the human eye in this radical way that that significantly displaced our role and our position in the universe um, had upon that time, and the and the and then even the, the, the artifacts and structures around those images, you know, the, the, the hand that draws them, the, the way he tries to use, uh, uh, as Mario describes, uh, the, the moons rotating around Jupiter or the sunspots in like cinematic flip books. Um, so here we've been seeing these images that are, are um, taken by very, um, you know, these aren't taken by a single eye looking at these planets. These are taken by scanners looking at them in all these various ways, as Brian is showing us, 
And then we synthesize images out of them. So in the presentation today, trying to show the kind of artifacts of that synthesis to, to show that these are a kind of, there's a, a, a construction to these photographs. And, um, and then the whole thing is actually choreographed via text messaging to the projector booth up there with my, when I, when I hear Kim saying something, it's like, okay, play this clip now. And uh, so, um, so it's a very you know, 21st century methodology. Uh, Lev, for maybe the last question. I don't think NASA even has done simulations like they have with these images of the moon doing their spinnings or Jupiters or the polar. I, I believe these are just simply new in the world. Yeah, so we can see then what we get from NASA and then the kinds of next transform, next kind of transformations we can do with them. Yeah, well, I actually thought that you were controlling everything from your laptop because it looked perfectly synchronized. So good, good. I think you guys are on your way to discover a whole new medium, actually. Uh, so my question is um, about um, um, this. So Galileo kind of belongs to an age when he and a few other people around that time uh, really discovered and established a scientific experimental method, which was 500 years ago. Now, two years ago, there was a feature article on Wired, which I'm sure that some of you know, by a Wired editor, Chris Anderson, which was called 500 years later, the end of theory, the dated deluge, deluge makes scientific method obsolete. And as I'm sure you know, I mean, the article was a kind of caricature, but at the same time, because it's really amplified something, but I think what amplified is very real, is the explosion of data right, available to dozens of scientific fields and the argument which was made is that, well, because we have so much data, we don't need to make experiments, right? or we don't need to make theory, we don't need to make models, we can just look for correlations. And um, again, I'm making maybe a caricature article, but that was a general drift. Hmm. So uh, now the work you're describing, right, in looking at the early stage of the universe, to me it actually looked like a very classical science, as you create a particular equipment, you, 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 know, you collect particular data, you have a kind of whole model, the time-space kind of model, but there are probably other areas of astronomy where, in fact, we do have perhaps something what Chris Anderson was fantasizing about, or maybe not. So maybe, you know, from anybody, some reflections about kind of Galileo, the beginning experimental method, versus this new kind of data age which we entered about maybe 10 years ago. So, um, and, and I, I'm not familiar with that article, but uh, one thing I could not emphasize in my talk is that um, we are doing classical astronomy in many ways. Uh, we're looking, making images. It just happens to be at the radio uh, frequencies. But what I attempted, um, what I neglected to say, uh, was that uh, what we're actually trying to image is not to make images of light, but to make images of gravity. And we're kind of on a threshold of what will be, in my mind, the next great frontier that perhaps even Galileo couldn't have envisioned, which is something called gravitational astronomy, where you're not using light, radio waves, x-rays, nothing in the, gra in the electromagnetic spectrum whatsoever. You're using the properties of pure gravity to detect uh, astrophysical, astronomical processes, including my research, which would be these remnants from this extremely early time, that imprint themselves only by gravity because we can't see beyond this point in the universe's age. So I, I would say that this, uh, this will be a revolution not unlike Galileo's revolution of looking at, the, you're, you're opening up, it's, it's like if humans discovered they had a new sense, which they never knew about before, and how that would change art and culture. Well, we're going to change that in astronomy, and it's a matter of technological progress, but we're getting there. This is LIGO. Lisa, very large projects that are ongoing now, but I do expect that they'll bear fruit in the upcoming decades, and then we have a new revolution in front of us, and we'll play a role in that as well in cosmology. Uh, a few comments about the the, the shift uh, that uh, you mentioned. I mean, there is no doubt that uh, I mean at this point there is uh, so much work that is uh, you know so data intensive that you know you can't find uh, any you know real precedent. But uh, in terms of data processing, I mean, think about, say, astronomical tables, say, you know, say the Rudolphine tables circa 1630. You're talking already massive amount of data, already kind of data processing techniques. 
uh, techniques to figure out, to kind of uh, you know, figure out error, uh, both observational error and you know, uh, error and calculation. So th there is already a lot of uh, data intensive work in astronomy, not in uh, say mechanics. But in astronomy, if you think, you know, just think about, you know, simple things like say, uh, you know, calculate the precession of the equinoxes, right? So basically you have to look at how the north uh, pole, the north celestial pole, you know, seems to move. <coughs> You need, uh, you know, you need to tabulate observations over hundreds of years. So, and, and the Babylonians were already doing this. So, so what I'm saying, you know, there is a huge amount of. So, and, and those, and there isn't really a lot of work on those aspects of science because they're totally boring. I know, but, you know, but, you know, but, but no, I'm not saying the results. I'm saying that for historians to, you know, do the kind of work is like you really need to have. It's an acquired taste, <laughs> uh, and, and, and it doesn't, you know, and not a lot of people, you know, you know take, uh, take to that. So, but anyway, so th 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 there, is, uh, there is quite a bit of stuff. Um, so I think we're already about 15 minutes past our time, and there's another event coming in here, so I, I'm going to have to clear the room. So thank you all. Thank you for coming.